this, right? Let's do this, boys. There's no better day than today to go do your best, right? So we got that. Actually, the first time I met John, we were in high school together, uh, and, and, and I think we were in the eighth grade, I think it was, and John and I were playing baseball against each other, and we after the game, uh, he actually beat our team, and after the game, uh, we played the same position, center field, on, and we went up and started talking to each other and have been friends ever since. Yeah. My favorite mem memory of John is actually on the baseball field. Uh, we were playing uh, a tournament uh, series together, and he made a fantastic, spectacular, spectacular play out in the outfield. And um, he was so humble about it. He was, he was said, he, you know, I'm doing this for the team, uh, and I'll do it again if the ball comes my way. And it, that just kind of told me right then and there who he was and what he was about. Yeah. But what I would say about John Morrow is. Um, uh, he's a guy that's very passionate about everything that he does, um, and uh, he's taken this sport uh, very seriously. Uh, from from an amateur, not too long ago, uh, his passion, his desire to be the best at what he can do, uh, has propelled him to the situation he's in today. Yeah. A little bit about John Morrow. You know, um, I'm in a stage in my life where I can reflect back and, and uh, you, you think about where you came from, where you've been, where you're trying to go in, in the path. Um, growing up, we didn't have a whole lot. See, I want to get emotional. Um, you know, my entire life, seriously, you know, my life has been riddled with people telling me what I can't do. I grew up in a very tough economic situation, so you know I can't go to college, or I can't have this, or I can't have that. Um, so no, you're fine. You know, I, I grew up in a, I grew up in a very tough economic circumstance, so you know I was told I can't have this, you know I can't have that, I can't have nice things, or I have to wear my sister's jeans, right, who's two years older than me, and that's a tough situation to grow up into. So as I continue to cross barriers in my life, and, and I've crossed quite a few of them professionally speaking, but now I'm, uh, I'm seeking new barriers and, you know, racing the Porsche GT3 Cup, and it's emotional to me. It's, it's emotional, uh, it's an emotional accomplishment, and I tell people that I'm accomplishment driven. Um, you know, you couple that with the last time I was in Austin, Texas, was uh, five years, six months, and two days ago. 
and uh, the significance of that was five years, six months, and two days ago, I almost died here. Um, I was literally, I had a 12 minute window to live, and um, I had four minutes left at the end of those 12 minutes of which I did live. And that's significant for me, um, you know, especially since this is championship weekend. And, um, you know, I, I, so I got a lot of emotions going on, and I just feel like, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not tough guy cool to talk about your emotions, but right now, I'm emotionally on edge, you know. I, 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 I put a face over it, you know, with my smile, my gregarious personality, and my socializing, um, and, and, and the passion for which I do, and the, pa the passion for which I, I try to compete and accomplish, see my accomplishments. Um, but inside, I'm telling you, it's, it's a little bit shaky. So, but in the world of sports and in the world of life, sometimes you gotta fake it till you make it. Don't show weakness. It was a tough situation. And um, I learned early what I didn't want. And I learned early who I didn't want to be. And, um, you know, life is still about making good choices. And I like to say to my children now, and sometimes I'm the example of what not to do. Um, cause there are two examples in life. You can, you can do what you're supposed to do and do what you want to do. And, and um, sometimes those are two different things. Um, but you can be the example of what to do or the example of what, what not to do. And I haven't always done the right thing, situa situationally speaking. Um, but you know what? I started a business. I started a healthcare company when I was 19 years old. Um, it's an interesting story. Um, but uh, long story short, we did okay. We are now one of the largest uh, niche healthcare companies in the United States. And through that success, um, it's helped me to have this opportunity in racing now, um, which is its own unique story because who walks into, who, who walks into a, a world champion or, or national champion uh, Porsche uh, team and says, hey, I want to buy a Porsche. I think I can be fast. You can imagine their, uh, their response. So we, we came to an agreement that uh, they'll sell me a car and they'll maintenance the car. Um, I had 17 hours on the car and 17 hours driving when I asked them to come back and go to the track with me and teach me how to drive the car. That day I ran within two seconds of a Porsche factory driver who was also there to help teach me the car. So it was 17 hours experience in any race car ever. I ran within two seconds of one of the best in the world. And that's when everybody sat up, noticed, and um, things started changing for me. So, you know, fast forward two years now, and, and I'm in my second year of um, the IGT, the International GT Mission Foods GT3 Cup Series. Uh, we are the 2016 champion. I think we won by three points, maybe four. Um, so we had a great season last year, and we're following that up this year with, um, with uh, another good run, and, and uh, we'll see how this goes after this weekend here at COTA, but uh, we hope to win another championship here this year. My name is Ed Warner, uh, I'm 50 years old, uh, known John for quite a long time, 45 plus years. We grew up together from 15 years ago. Johnny wasn't sure what he was wanting to do and he was working for me and sleeping on my couch. But I can tell you one thing, when, when we were all working, growing, I mean playing growing up, Johnny was working and now Johnny's playing and we're all working. <laughs> You know, I've had the privilege and it's truly also been an honor to know John for over five years now. And the thing that I've come to learn from very early on is that he's not had an easy road his entire life. You know, there's many times where we, he's, have, he's had obstacles, trials, tribulations, struggles, all thrown at him. There's so many times where he's been able to just look at the situation and no one would blame him for just giving up. No one would blame him for not pursuing this dream of his, but you know what, he didn't. He continued to persevere on when honestly many of us probably would just quit. That's one of the many things that makes John special is he had a dream. He knew in his heart that there was more destined for himself. And when many others said it wasn't gonna be able to be done, he said no. I guess reflectively, I would say that, you know, I can't dismiss DNA. You know, my, my mom had a good heart and she was very caring. Um, 
you know, my father cared in his way. Neither one of them, for me, were the best parents in the world. And I'm saying that candidly. I love both of them, and I wouldn't be where I am, you know, without, you know, that influence, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but having said that, you know, when, when you have this, this wanting, you, you, feel, you feel this void and you seek it out and you're not getting it, you know, traditionally, if you would, in, in the family, you know, mother, father, siblings, whatnot, um, my friends became my family. Um, you know, and, and I, if you would, even back then, as a young boy, it was, you know, vicariously, I'm, I'm trying to be included in this, this dynamic, this family dynamic that I just had a longing for. Um, you know, and that, that, that was the birth of an insecurity, if you would. And, um, you know, we've, we, we've long, accept, long since accepted that, you know, in, in, in it's, it's knowledge, public knowledge, that I just, I didn't, I didn't grow up with a whole lot. We had a lot of wants, um, you know, and, and we didn't have a lot of needs. I mean, we, we were provided for, don't get me wrong, but I wanted more for myself. I knew, I, I've known to my earliest memory that, that there was something that I was going to do that was more than where I was. And, um, you know, I think, um, I think as you, as you progress in your, your, your path in life, as you reach new and, and new plateaus, it's not who you are that makes you great, if you would. It's not what you do that makes you great, so to speak. It's who you bring with you, right? It's, it's how you inspire others to their greatness, you know? It's, it's, how you, it's how you bring people along with you or you inspire other people. You never know who's looking. You know, this, this whole Mario Motorsport thing, you know, we put a lot of kids in the race car. You know, they'll come up and they'll look at it and I'll be, you know, I might be 30 feet away and I'll say, hey, I know the guy that owns the car, go ahead and, go ahead and have a seat in it. And they're like, what? And they'll put their kids in the car. And you just never know what mind, body, and soul that you're inspiring for the next next. So you know what, it's, to me, it's, it's, there's no better feeling than giving. Giving is, is just the best feeling in the world, and you know, I'm in a position to give. And, and I think it's, 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 uh, it's very fulfilling, yeah. So maybe that's it, I don't know. What has meant the most to me during this time racing? You know, that's, that's probably a two-part answer on my behalf. Um, you know, you, you, you recall me talking about accomplishments and pushing the boundaries and not getting stuck in the uh, comfort zone. Um, this was a big bite. I, 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 I took a big chew here. I remember more than once taking my helmet off, getting into the privacy of, of the corner of a garage or, or the privacy of our hauler, and just having some having some real moments with myself, you know, can I do this? You know, real moments of doubt. Um, you know, can I do this? Maybe this is too much. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Um, and again, that's where that self confidence and that self esteem come into play. Because for me, anyway, I look around and I say, you know what? They're doing it. 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 Why not me? And, and I'm a huge believer in why not me. So, so the first part of my answer would be, you know, it, it's being able to push your limits and reach for new plateaus. The second answer for me is, is the people in racing. It's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's legendary. You hear everybody tell stories about the people of racing, whether it's the fans, the track workers, the series directors, and the, and the people that you come into contact with, the other competitors. It is, it is a, a tight-knit family environment that I've never really experienced. So that's what I like about racing. Uh, 
What is the first memory you had of John and what did you think initially of him? <laughs> so I met John first at a NASA race at Mid-Ohio. He was uh, uh, very eager to be there. And you know, it was interesting because he had obviously not had a lot of experience in the car yet. Um, it was something very new to him. Um, but I've never seen a guy more driven to make get out there and get better. And so um, he's always full of excitement. He's always uh, fired up. Uh, but what I've seen in, uh, since that first time is uh, a maturing in his, in his driving style uh, based on his experience on the track uh, and his relationships with other, other drivers that he's really learned how to be aggressive and competitive but also to be uh, safe on the racetrack, which is an important part of what we all do. Uh, you know, we most of us have other jobs that we do, uh, and we do this because of the excitement of it, and because of the camaraderie of it, and because of the friendship. Uh, but we want to make sure we put the car back in the trailer the way it came out. So, uh, John's done a great job of that. When you think of John Morrow, what comes to mind? Oh, that's easy. Uh, you know, I saw John, John came's first race he came to was Mid-Ohio a couple of years ago. And the first thing I, I, I noticed about John was his pro professional presentation. You know, uh, I, I have to say, I looked over and I didn't know um, uh, at first if he was running with, with our group. And, uh, but he, the, the team and the presentation was very professional. Uh, he was the only guy with tire warmers in the whole paddock area, you know, whether, but in June, I didn't know if we, that, that was necessary, enough, but you know, it was a very professional presentation. That was number one. And then uh, in meeting John personally, okay, uh, and, and to this day, I kid him, I mean, it is like the Energizer Bunny on steroids. I mean, he's the most enthusiastic guy and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, he's been a great cheerleader of the series. Um, I'm very happy to have customers like John that are enthusiastic about. Uh, John, I think, is enthusiastic about anything he does, and you'll know, you know, uh, he goes he goes full tilt. And uh, uh, so, I, as I said, my, the number one thing is, is the un, unbridled enthusiasm is, uh, you know, is, is John. So in my short uh, career, if you would, of racing, what moment do I cherish the most? Um, honestly, everyone. I am having the most fun I've ever had in my life. I've got so many blessings, um, they're, they're unfathomable. Um, and it's not just the me, me, me of this world. That's, those aren't blessings. It's what you can share. It's, it's the friends that support you at home. It's the people that, um, well, the, the day before yesterday, I get a, te a, a text and they're like, Hey, um, John, where are you guys racing this weekend? I just saw a Motor Motors, a Mario Motorsport t-shirt in the airport. <laughs> you know, and that was kind of neat. You know, and, and, I'll, and I'll get text about our hauler going up the highway. Hey, I just saw that Mario Motorsport hauler. So, you know what? Being a good example, I think, is, um, is, is very important. You know, trying to be positive, trying to always be smiling. And, and I know there's a, there's a lot of things, a lot of chatter around the paddock about the energy that I carry. And um, you know what, I, I just try to, to lead with passion. I am very passionate about everything I do. And, and I think, you know, the, the funny story is there was a guy named Brian Lingram that ran with us last year. And Brian was instrumental to a lot of things as, as far as how I race today. And uh, peripherally, I heard him tell this story. And, and it still makes me laugh because I think he hit it pretty much on the head. He's like, you know, he's like, John, you know, people see John and they see all this energy and they see this bam and and uh, they just think somebody, you know, it's kind of a face or just, you know, he's putting a show on for people. And he's like, you know, I've, I've traveled with John a lot now and I can tell you that there is a moment in time when he wakes up from his sleep, there's about a six second delay before bam, he turns it on. And I tell you what, it is all natural. It's, there's no stimulation, there's no coffee, caffeine, that guy just goes. And when I heard him say that, I, I, to me, it was one of the best compliments in the world. Um, I respect Brian a lot. So you know what, I try to bring a lot of energy and uh, passion to the racetrack.
that I have as not only a photographer, but the videographer. And I really see that now in the post editing process was, you know, John had a whole team down there. Um, and unfortunately we don't really have videos or I, I didn't get videos of them to bring into this documentary. Um, I wasn't able to interview everyone. Uh, you know, I was running all over the place and, and looking back at it now, I wish I had taken more time. You know, we, we got to interview Mark um, and Ed, but, you know, unf unfortunately, Ronnie Jackson, you know, didn't get any video time. Bill Callison, Colin McHugh, you know, all those guys were instrumental to John as far as his team members. I mean, every morning, Ronnie was making breakfast for everyone, and that might not seem like much, but that's huge. Especially, you know, John's running all over the place. He's running over his videos. I'm literally driving all around the track trying to get uh, photos and videos set up and stuff like that. So, you know, the fact is, you know, Ronnie's been a lifelong friend of John and, you know, he doesn't make it into this documentary at all. Um, Bill Callison, you know, lead mechanic for John and I didn't take the time to interview him. Colin, you see a lot of Colin because a lot of shots are John, of John are reviewing video and Colin's right there because he's the data guy. You know, he gathers all that data for John and, and compiles it for him. Um, you know, this this weekend we had Jan Halen there, Jason Hoover, um, two guys that are instrumental to John. I mean, Jan is incredible to watch and just to be around. And then Jason, as you'll see in a little bit, you know, how John views Jason and the future that uh, John sees working with Jason uh, is instrumental. But as well, we have Julie Bentley and Ken Fengler with International GT. I mean, they're not a part of John's team, but a part of the association and their generosity, their willingness to help me as a videographer and photographer were instrumental. I, I can't thank them enough. And then Ben Sissel with SVRA, you know, probably one of the best shots, photos I've ever taken in my young and short photography career was thanks to Ben. You know, number one, Ben got me my media pass uh, vest. So I got free access and free reign of the whole course, which was a, a dream come true in all reality. But the fact is, is that we set up on the track and Ben was the one that had the idea of how to set the photo up, the composition. So yeah, I'm the guy with the camera and I'm the one taking the photo and doing the post editing to give to Julie and Ken with International GT, but in all reality, that was Ben's photo. I mean, he came up with a composition and the idea, the concept, so I have to give credit to Ben because he's been in the industry for years now and the great thing about it as a young videographer and photographer, I got to spend four days and I just got little snippets of information and experience and knowledge out of them and it was crucial, it was vital. Um, so thank you, Ben, uh, for giving me that composition and for everything, I really appreciate it. But overall to the whole team, it, it was rough not being able to share all their stories, but thankfully John in this next part talks about them and talks about his pit crew. You know, my pit crew, my team, um, my data engineers, um, really how do, how do we run the business of, of, of racing? Um, early on, you know, I, I'd shared that, that I got with Wright Motorsports and they're clearly one of the best in the world at what they do. So what I tried to do is I tried to be a good imitator. Um, they've got a great business model. So I tried to build Mario Motorsport after what I saw Wright Motorsport do. Um, you know, part of that, and I think one of the most important things that they taught me was how to, how to look at data, how to evaluate data, and how to use data to get better. So you know what, we went to MoTeC school and um, you know, me and, and a couple of our, of our uh, pit crew members, our team members, and um, we went to MoTeC school because you're only as good as the data. If you're, if you're practicing the wrong things, you're not practicing to get better, you're practicing to get worse. And that's not okay with me. You know, that's just a waste of time, money, effort, and energy. You know, one of the best compliments I, I feel that I get from people, you know, here in the paddock and, and in other areas in life is they say that John Morrow does things with intent. And I like that. I do, I do try to do things with intent. So, you know what, the pit crew that we've assembled, just a group of great guys. Again, it's that, it's that secondary level of family. Um, 
I would have to say that over the past probably three years, watching him go from where he first started to where he is at now is, I mean, he's just improved so much. I mean, I'm not saying you know, he was bad to begin with, but, you know, he has learned so much and, you know, he takes it all in and applies it on the track. And, you know, I, I think he could get in anything and, and be successful on the track and, and run with anybody. So, my most, most memorable moment with John overall has been when we got to run Indianapolis and he just, he, he was so emotional. After the one run, he got out and gave me a big hug and was so excited because Indianapolis is such an iconic track. Um, my most memorable moment of this season would be winning at Sebring. You know, it was um, a very good moment overall, winning at Sebring. You know, we, we spend a lot of time together, you know, on the road, so we've you know, kind of all become like second, you know, family to each other. You know, we, we know a lot about each other. We we fight like brothers, you know. We, we have fun together. So, you know, it's all, it's all in a, a family atmosphere with this team. We go through a lot together. You see a lot, you know, behind the scenes. You know, you do all these days of travel and, and the good, the bad, and sometimes you get a little testy, sometimes we yell at each other. Um, but just like with any other family, you know what? Sometimes you just have to give, a, give everybody a grain of salt. It could be the stress of the day, it could be the emotion of the day, and, and none of it's ever personal. You know, so again, the team environment, you know, again, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. There is no I in team. I, John Morrow, could not do this by himself. I needed the direction of, of Wright Motorsports and, or, and Jan Halen um, and, and other people that I've worked with early on to show me what it is and then to have their data to compare against, do an overlay of my data on top of their data so I can see what I'm not doing that they are doing. And it's always what I'm not doing and what they are doing. And that's honestly how I got better. And then it was putting my own team together to, again, repeat the success that I saw in Wright Motorsports, you know. So the data was one thing, having people that, that, can, that can work on my car and make sure that my car is in good shape, um, be it the brakes or, or, the, or the toe or, or the setup of the car. That's very important too as, as far as going fast. So you know what, you're only as good as those people around you. So I try to put together a good team and I think we've done well. So the first time I met John was actually an indoor karting track back home in Cincinnati. I was working, and he would come in on every Tuesday and run all day long. Um, to be honest, when I first thought when I first met him, I didn't like him at all. I thought he was kind of, you know, out there too much. And then he invited me to Sebring, and I went down with him. And we realized he's a really good guy and knows what the heck he's talking about and doing. So you just got to hang out with him to understand John. Being a data guy, um, it has opened me up to higher opportunities. Um, it's helped me take in my, my experiences to higher levels. Um, and I, next year, I have the possibility of working with a professional racing team doing data with them. Jason's a whole nother level. Jason Hoover? Mm -hmm. He's a whole nother, he's a whole nother level of experience and professionalism and knowledge. Um, you know, so, so what does Jason Hoover bring bring to the bring to the equation? Um, you know, he's he's you know the term guru, right? A lot of people use it, right? Oh, you know, guru this, guru that, and um, I think it's overused. And uh, Jason, I've learned more in what he says under his breath, just talking to himself. Then I've learned, in some cases, people sitting me down and trying to teach me something. Sometimes it's, it's, it's you, can be, you can be so good at your profession mm -hmm. that even the little table scraps that you kind of just, kind of, uh, that you think is nothing, for an up-and-comer like me and somebody that's new, I've only, I've only been racing two years. You know, I just kind of had, had a steep, steep, um, steep learning curve and, and early success.
So stop. Yeah. I should be flat. Yeah, see, you're, you, it's not that you're early. You're freaking, you are keeping the car in tighter. Okay, so when I, when I carry more speed, you can drive out a little bit and then come back again. Then I gotta force it over here, jump yeah. on the brakes and turn it back in. Yeah, but that's fine. So you're gonna, if you come out a half a, a car, a, a car, half a car width to your left. On this one. Yes, right, and then out and then back in again. Okay. I don't think, right, it's just, that's just the way the racetrack is, right? That's what you're just gonna have to do. Okay. But this is almost like, this is almost like, uh, end of some of his, his some of his little 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 crumbs um, it's pretty exciting to me um, sometimes I, I, I sometimes I hang out with Jason and I get, I get, get, get goosebumps because I know I know it's a good synergy and I know if he's gonna help me get to that next level of success and that, that excites me racing taught me about life um, for me and, I, and maybe it's, this is different for everybody but for me what is racing taught me about life it's a uh, it's a continuation of, uh, of, of good habits um, and uh, I believe that if uh, well you know what I there's a there's a loose interpretation of a philosopher uh, named, named Frederick Nietzsche and um, the loose interpretation is no matter where you are you're right where you're supposed to be and, and my, my summary of that, or my take on that, is if you make good decisions and, and, and you try to progress and, and you stay out of a comfort zone because nothing happens in a comfort zone, you try to continue that, continue, that, that ladder of continuous improvement, um, that's a nice repeatable model for a lifetime. And so, you know, I started a business early, we had some success. I fell off for about three years and I was bored. I mean, bored out of my mind. I found racing, um, we, became, we came, became pretty good at it. And um, so what has racing taught me about life? It taught me to not get into the comfort zone, to push your boundaries, and to seek new accomplishments. Whether they're big accomplishments or small accomplishments, I firmly believe that all accomplishments have a value to them because your self-esteem is always listening and your self, your, self, um, your self esteem is always listening and your self confidence is always listening. And when you can put recognition of these accomplishments, one on top of another, it becomes a lifestyle and that becomes a, a, a life worth living. Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it's um, I've had a hard life. You know, I, I think the, um, the misconception, and this is somewhat frustrating, and I understand there's a brand image um, and I understand that, that there is a persona that goes with everything. And I know that I got this gregarious personality and it's kind of like, bam, and I know it's kind of like, oof, you know, and, but it is genuine, it is genuine. And I think, you know, sometimes I feel frustrated that, you know, sometimes people look at me and they don't see the genuine. Maybe I don't show it enough, um, you know, and that sometimes is a personal reflection of mine. Again, I can do better. Maybe I can do better showing the genuineness or making my circle a little bit wider so more people can come in. But. You know, the point is, 
you know, we started, uh, I say we, but me, I, um, we started a healthcare company when I was 19 years old, and, and it's, it's a specialty healthcare company, it's a niche field, and we're one of the largest in the United States right now, and that healthcare company is what helps to sponsor, excuse me, my racing team, um, you know, amongst some other great sponsorships, and, um, but people see, see it now, they see it today, and they don't realize, you know, where I came from or, or what I've had to endure um, you know it, it surprises most people when I tell them I graduated in the bottom 10% of my high school class you know um, I am a motivational speaker um, I, I am the president of a healthcare company that's one of the largest in the country I give um, professional expert opinions and testimonies and speeches throughout the country in that career field um, but when people learn that I graduated in, graduated in the bottom 10% of my class, they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I was under-motivated. No so, college degree. Right? right? No college degree. I got kicked out of three colleges. <laughs> you know? Um, you, we won't go into depth on that story. Um, you know, but it's, it's, again, everything in life is valuable. Everything. And the world needs everybody. Um, and, and I latched on to some philosophies very early in life. And, and I've shared it already before, and I've said that, you know, no matter where you are, you're right where you're supposed to be. And, and you've earned it. And you've earned it, you know. And sometimes there's rewards and sometimes there's consequences. And I've had plenty of consequences. Um, you know, met a guy about three weeks ago. Um, he was an Army veteran of, of recent um, service and duty, and um, he'd lost both legs. And he was at the racetrack, and um, you know, I didn't, I didn't go up to him, I didn't, didn't engage him, you know. But, but I was watching other people, you know, walk up. I mean, clearly, he's got, he's, he doesn't have, he doesn't have two legs, and he's wearing shorts, no less, you know. So you can see, you know, you can see the apparatus. So you know, a lot of times that draws people come in, shake your hand, you know, hey, thank you for your service, and a lot of people do that. The pats on the back, and I think that's very well appreciated, um, you know. But I've got some Army Ranger friends of mine, and, and they've really influenced me. And, um, you know, they'll talk about their experiences, especially amongst each other. Um, but I learned very, very quick not to ask. You know, hey, what was this like? Or, hey, did you do this? Or, hey, have you done that? If they want to tell you, they're going to tell you. You know, but it's not my place to ask. It's not for my enjoyment or my entertainment. It's not for my curiosity. Um, so this gentleman, he was in the paddock, you know, and I noticed him. And I know what I noticed about him was not his legs. He was happy, he was gregarious, he was outgoing, he was candid and animated. And th those are the things that, that I notice, right? The, the positive attitudes, because that's, that's what kind of a, you know, that's, those are things that I try to model myself after. Well, you know, he was kind of watching me too, and, and, and so, you know, we, we kind of crossed paths one time, and, and we just started talking, and, um, and he said to me, he says, you know, John, he says, Normally wouldn't say this to too many people, he says, you know, and we were off in a private, you know, private part of the garage. And he says, it kind of bothers me when, when people say, you know, you're so happy. You know, you, you, you've lost both your legs and you have this positive outlook on life. And you're so happy and you've got a great deal of self-confidence. And he says to me, it kind of bothers me because I want to look at them and say, yeah, I've, I've lost both my legs, I've had incredible challenges, and you're complimenting me for being happy, and all I want to say to you is, why aren't you happy? You've got both your legs. You don't have the challenges that I've had. Your path can be a little bit easier than mine. Why aren't you happy? And there was a kinship in that moment, because again, people look at me in the here and now, the healthcare company, the, the motivational speaker part, and they don't realize the challenges I've been through you know so you know at the end of the day we are all compelled to do our best and and for me the value of um, the value of just trying you know if you start with no and you ask a question and the answer is no what have you lost you know and in in through my time in business and, and in racing and in friendships I, I guess one of the things reflectively that I would share is you know it's it's a matter of battling the demon from within the self-doubts um, battling the doubts of everybody around you I mean sometimes family and friends can be can be your, your worst self-doubters 
Um, and you know what? I just, I, I like to prove me right, which is a different answer than, than proving somebody else wrong. And I know that may sound terrible, and, and I don't mean it to, um, but again, in my accomplishment-driven world, when you're trying to do big things, and, and, and big things for me, you know, not big things that, that other people, I just want to be the best me. He is a genuine friend. He's absolutely a genuine friend. It's, you know, he still lives in Ohio. I live down here in Texas, 1,300 miles apart, but we talk all the time. I show up here today and it's like, we've never been apart. That's just always how we've been. Yeah. You know, comes down and sees the kids. It's like he lives next door. That's that's just him. Just genuine. Uh, the, the, the qualities that I admire from John are just his, his, his helpfulness, his willing to coach and teach people, uh, his willing to, to his drive to move forward all the time, no matter how good life is or how bad life is, always moving forward. Uh, his ability to, like I said, care. You know, he's he's my son's godfather. Calls and checks on him. Um, he's into auto tech, so Johnny has him out here showing him everything in the world. So, stuff that I couldn't do. Well, some of the things that, I've, that I admire about John Morrow is the fact that he's tenacious, he's passionate, and he cares about people. You know, he, he really cares about people, but he, he tries to bring the best out of himself and the people that's around him. Um, and his positive mental attitude is probably his biggest attribute that he brings to the table every day. Uh, without that, we're pretty much nothing anyway, right? John's grown a lot as a race car driver over the four years that I've been with him. I think the thing that he has done very well is take the experience that he gets in every session and put it to use. Uh, he is always studying his uh, all his data. He's always looking at film. He's willing to share and talk with others about it. Uh, you know, so he's always been willing to share knowledge that he's getting, but also absorb knowledge from other people. There's been plenty of times where. We're, Maybe I'm a little quicker in some place, and he goes, come on, let's go out together and let's run together. And quite frankly, this, he's gotten better. There's been a lot more of him saying, come on, follow me. Let's go make this work. And a lot about race car driving is learning where the edge of the car is. And John does a very good job at finding where the edge of the race car is. And that's where the fun runs. If you can get up to that edge, that's where it's really, it really brings out the best of yourself. The other thing about yeah, I say about John is that you know the enthusiasm. Many people, you know, if, you know, you know, when you see somebody that enthusiastic, and I have friends like that, you know, it's like they have a serious case of ADD that they cannot focus. Um, John is not that person. John is a great student of the. He's always wants to, you know. Uh, the other thing I notice about John is is he wants to learn every single time out, and. Um, he was very humble coming into the first race and saying, I'm, I'm new to this. And he is relatively new. There are guys who have raced here long. I, I couldn't tell you how long John's raced, but I think it's less than five years, really, which in this business, there are guys, you know, I've been around it for 35, and there are guys who've run, raced in a lot of different places. So John's come a long way in a short time. That didn't happen by accident, you know. Um, his uh, professional presentation and preparation of what he gets demands out of his crew. Uh, but he also, uh, you know, the good thing about that, he demands that out of himself. And, uh, you know, it doesn't always go right. You know, it's not always perfect. And, uh, you know, uh, there are times that I've had to go to him and say, that's not right, and he understood. And there's times he, he's come to me and said, I didn't do that right at all, you know. So uh, uh, he's a great student of the, uh, and I think that's why he's uh, really had the success he's had in a, in a short period of time, you yeah. You know, being a father, um, listen, it's, it's a responsibility. Neither one of my children has to be born. 
you know um, that was a choice that, that that I made with their mothers um, so yeah you know what it's it's important to me to be a good father and, and quite frankly both daughters need a different father if you would my oldest daughter and I we are incredibly close um, you know, and, and some of that is because of who we are. We both feel that we're hammers and everything else in the world is a nail. And, um, you know, and, 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 and at my age at this point in, in, in my life, I realize I don't have to be a hammer. There's a better technique. Um, you know, and, and I just I keep trying to, to lead her through the experiences that I've been through um, to help, to just to help navigate her, you know, through some things. Whether they're, they're personal difficulties or, 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 or obstacles that come along the path. Now, my youngest daughter, you know, she's, she's, just, like, she's just like her mother. Um, and she's just, she's just a beautiful person. She is, she is the, the quintessential ray of sunshine. She's always smiling. She's always happy. She always, always has that, that right personality at the right time. She, uh, she needs a different father, okay? She and I aren't that this that this closeness that, that I have with my oldest, but she needs me there in her circle of influence almost selfishly. So when she turns to me, I need to be there. And she'll turn to me in a lot of different creative ways and I have to be able to listen to her and sometimes read between the lines. You know, whether it's a text or a, or a, um, a FaceTime, um, whether it's a phone call. I texted her this morning about 5.30 in the morning and told her I was thinking about her and that I was proud of her. She has a soccer game today. And all I said is, uh, do your best. Your best is always good enough. And, and I try to portray that in what I do. But no, you know what, there's a lot of things that keep me grounded in it. And it's just not my family. It's just not, um, you know, my daughters, which is, you know, the point of this question. My friends ground me in, in you know, um, keeping the humility is, is incredibly important. Um, the humility for me is 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 paramount you know that that keeps things in perspective so yeah we talk about this um, <laughs> daddy does some dangerous stuff it's not I mean this racing stuff is dangerous don't get me wrong um, but this is safe compared to some of the other stuff I do um, you know flying helicopters I, I tell you a story I've ran out of I've ran out of gas in a helicopter twice <laughs> So um, that's a story perhaps for another day. Um, you know, so I, I make sure that I actively, again, and, and not, a, not aggressively, that's not the word, but I make sure that I'm consistently talking with them and having these real life moment talks. And, um, you know, we talk about, you know, giving, giving love, receiving love, showing love. You know, those are, those are three different types of loves. And um, I think those are also, you know, embodiments. So, you know, the, the relationship I have with my daughter, and it, my daughters, and it's not just my daughters, you know. Um, it's, the, it's the significant people in my life. You know, my, my friends, we talked about Eddie Warner, we've, we've talked about Ronnie Jackson, we've talked about Mark um, and, and Colin, and just, there are significant people in your life, you know. My sister Lisa, and, and there's, there's people that come along and they provide a great deal of depth and significance. And, and for me anyway, I don't want to let my family, friends, and significant people down. You know, so again, it's, it's a repeatable thing for me. Um, I gotta be the best me I can be every day. That's my measure. Be the best me. And, and you know what? If by example, my daughter Brooke wants to be the best her, if by example, my daughter Nicole wants to be the best her um, every day, then I've, I've done well. You know, I, I have a saying, and it's one of my favorite sayings. This is my shoe. It doesn't walk by itself. This shoe will not go anywhere I don't take it. If I take this shoe to someplace good, good things are gonna happen. If I take this shoe to someplace bad, chances are something bad's gonna happen. But this shoe does not walk by itself. This shoe only goes where I direct it. So you know what? We got to be careful where we take our shoes, and that's the one message I really try to say to my to my to my children, or or to if you would my circle of influence. You know where you take your shoes is, is very important. I'm gonna put my shoe back on. <laughs> All right. You know, so if I'm walking across the paddock, yeah, I'm not wearing any Mario Motorsport things. I just just Joe Guy at the race racetrack. 
And, um, you know, I hear some people talking. Perhaps I'm in the concession stand line. And I hear some people talking. And then, you know, all of a sudden they turn to me and they're like, hey, have you seen that John Morrow guy race? You know, what do you think about him? You know, um, what would I want them? You know, what, what would I want? What, what would flatter me? Or, or how do I want to be looked upon? You know, first of all, you, you are who you are. Um, and you are how you act. And so for me, I guess collectively in the paddock uh, from, a, from a, a race fan perspective or, or anybody that might be looking on, I want people to look at me as a positive role model. Somebody who inspires people to say, yes, I can. Um, I want my competitors to know that I race hard. And I race hard. Nothing Nothing irks me more than a car that's in front of me. I've never tried to win a race in my life. I just do not like when a car is in front of me. So I'm trying to pass it. I don't care what it is. I don't care, I don't care if it's a 458 Ferrari. I don't care, I don't care if it's a 99. I don't care. I do not like a car in front of me. It just it doesn't sit well with me. So it's not about winning for me. It's just about getting past the next, the next obstacle in front. So, you know what, I, I guess I, I would like people to say, you know, about John Morrow is that, you know what, he's accessible, he's always smiling, um, he's, he's always in a good mood, um, he infects people with his passion and his drive, I hope they say that, and um, I, I do do want my, race, my, my racing um, competitors to say, you know what, that guy's good, he'll race you hard, you know, and you can run door to door with him, you know, in that regard it's about respect. Absolutely. So he, from a, uh, John's competitiveness is great. I mean, it's it's palatable when you're around it. He's excited to be at the racetrack. He's excited to get involved with what's going on. Uh, but he's there to win. And so he is constantly trying to learn. He is on the racetrack. He is somebody that I feel comfortable going door to door with, side by side, into any, any place, understanding that he's going to do the right thing. And that's important. Uh, that's what frankly really bonds the friendship with the drivers that we have is when you race with them and you understand that their awareness of the track and their ability to put the car where they need to put it to race close but safe uh, really is a big uh, an attraction and something that John's really gotten very good at. You know, John is here to compete. Let me, don't get me wrong, John is the nicest, most genuine, sincere person you will ever meet. And I truly mean that with from the bottom of my heart. But John is here to compete. You know, and the best way I thought about it for the whole week and then the these two weeks of post-editing and, and uh, processing, you know, when John gets in that race car, he is a boxer stepping into a boxing ring and he is gonna do everything he can to knock you out.
you know, we talked about the fact that John is the hardest worker. And I hope that we get to capture that in this documentary because, you know, <laughs> we have some footage of inside the car when he's racing. And then 70% of all the other video footage we have is him in the trailer um, watching video, going over his data. I cannot tell you how hard this man works. And, you know, there's so much footage that we have where I'm like, man, this, I mean, it's in the same location. It's inside his trailer. But that was John. John was training harder than anyone else. So John put the bunch of effort into being a race car driver. He's all, once he's training, when he gets out of the car, he goes to the hauler, we go over data and video every time for hours at a time. So I think he's one of the very few out of the whole whole paddock that'll do that. And that makes him a great race car driver. You know, he's going over the video and he's and he's going through his turns and he's just practicing nonstop. And I remember it was, I think it was night three. I get up, it's 12.30 at night, one o'clock in the morning, and John is the last person to always go to bed. And so, again, I think it's one o'clock in the morning, I get up to use the bathroom and all I hear is, you know, coming from his room. And it was John watching a video. We got up the next day. I think John and I were normally some of the first people to wake up in the morning and you know, we'd take our shower. So I remember we, you know, John took his shower, he got out of the bathroom and then I went in, uh, took my shower really quick. And as I got out, sure enough, you just hear the video play. People don't understand, you know, John gives 110% in everything he does, nonstop day in, day out, not when the cameras are rolling, not when people are around, when he's in the privacy of his own home, he's given 110%. When he is inside that race car, he is given 110%. John gives you 110% in every single aspect of his life.
into today? <laughs> um, this CODA, Circuit of the Americas, is in Austin, Texas. Five years ago, four days, and it's five, five years, four days, and about three and a half hours ago, I was having a very serious heart attack here in Austin. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but it was called an LAD. And, uh, an, an LAD. The, 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 the short term for that in the medical field is they call it a widow maker. Um, because it, it kills something like 99% of the population that experience an LED because you basically have a 12 minute window to get help and, and, and to, to survive it. I was lucky and blessed enough to be two and a half blocks from a hospital. It was about 5.30 in the morning and I woke up and you know every instinct I had said I'm having a heart attack. and. You know, you talk yourself out of it. You're like, no, I don't. No, yeah, no, I'm going to go lay down. So I went back and laid down, and I instantly popped back up, and I said, oh, I'm having a heart attack. I looked at the car keys on the table, and I started doing the math about, you know, if I call 911, 991 comes, and, and they take me to the hospital. I thought that I could have already been to the hospital three times. So I made the, the decision to drive myself. Again, it was two and a half blocks. You know, most medical professionals tell you not to do that because what if you have a heart attack in the car, you hurt yourself and those around you. In this case, it was 5.30 in the morning and it was part of my calculations. So I walked into the emergency room and I said, I think I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> um, turns out I was having a real deal heart attack. And um, you know, it's, it's an event in life, rightfully so, that, that really did change me. Um, it, it changed a lot of my perspectives and I think it even changed how I live or how I actively live um, how I actively love how I actively pursue to be my best how I actively just just do um, you know and, and it's the last time I was in Austin so this this is more than just a little emotional for me you know we're here running for a championship hopefully it's a back-to-back -back championship we walked in with a five-point lead. Um, we didn't get the job done. I didn't get the job done. The car's fully capable of running faster than I'm pulling the time. Um, you know, it just it wasn't in the cards in yesterday's race. So you know what? If I win today, I win a championship. If I don't win today, I'm going to lose a championship by maybe two or three points. Either way, I did my best, and that's okay with me. You know, life is full of ups and downs, and, and it's it's as my mom would say. You know, Johnny, it's, it's, it's not about what life's doing to you. It's not about what's happening to you. It's about how you're going to respond to it. And so, you know what? That's an embodiment that I try to portray. So, yeah, you know, Austin is emotional for me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Didn't win the championship. No, I didn't. I, you know what I did? I did. Did you hear the Ferrari guys come over? Dude, we love running with you. If you're not here next year, you know, it's just not going to be the same. You know? Todd Sloan, you know, things that he says to me in private, you know, you've come a long way. You know, Brad Waite, and they give you genuine compliments. You know, I've only been racing for two years. Yeah. And, and they're genuine. And, and look, you know what I could do right now? I could get online and go buy me a trophy. Right? Mm -hmm. If I just want something to set up on something, you know? 2017 runner-up, first loser, right? Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you this, and, and, I, and it's, it's becoming evident, and, and it makes me emotional, um, but I'm well-respected as a driver and, and, and as a nice guy. This is hard. This is really hard. You know, you practice it in your head, what you're going to say. You know, making this film, this documentary, going down there, taking photos, it's been a dream come true. You know, what John doesn't know, and what actually no one else knows, is probably one of my dreams was to be a professional photographer, to a certain extent. You know, I, one, I love college football. And for the last three years, I've 
gone to a University of Oregon duck game, and I see these photographers on the field, and I see them with their vests on, with their media passes, and I've actually emailed the University of Oregon asking them, hey, what do I need to provide you? What do I need to do? I cannot tell you how many events I've been to, and I see these people with their cameras, and you know, they get passes, and I've always dreamt John did that for me. You know, I remember when he contacted me, he said, hey, what are you doing the first week of November? Nothing, just working. All right, I'm flying you down to Texas. You're gonna be my uh, personal photographer for this event. I said, okay. Had me sign my name on a piece of paper, and then he said, here you go, man. And then I had my, my neon vest that said media on the back. So many times, you know, people will say, well, who is John Morrow? John Morrow has been the most significant person in my life over the last five years. Every single personal and professional accomplishment or progressive step that I have reached, John has had a direct impact on. You know, John made my dream come true. He doesn't even realize it until now. Um, for four days, I got to live my dream. So, you know, at the end of the week, John, uh, John didn't win the championship. You know, we went in there with high hopes. We went in there confident, right? You know, John is going to pull out a 2017 championship back to back. But he didn't win a trophy. And he talks about that. You know, I asked him, I said, so we didn't win a championship. And he stops and he said, you know what, I did. I did win a championship. You see, what we didn't have video of is we're packing up the trailer, the hauler, with the car and everything else. And this other team of mechanics uh, for the Ferrari team came over and hung out with John. And they're like, dude, we love racing with you, man. You're so much fun to be around. You bring so much life into this circuit. And he's like, I am a champion because those guys, you know, enjoy having me around. And that's what John is. John has the heart of a champion. You see, it wasn't just my dream that John impacts. You know, we had uh, Casey Warner, Ed Warner's son. You know, John brings the whole family down and Casey's into auto tech and all this stuff and so, you know, how many kids get a behind the scenes look at a professional race car, at a professional race car team, getting to be in the pit, getting to be in the garage, getting to have full access to the entire track. How many kids get that opportunity? Casey did. John knew that Casey loved this stuff and so he brought him down. You know, Colin, a part of a, uh, John's team, data team, you know, Colin's dream has been to be in this circuit, to be in racing. And because of Colin's hard work and because of John bringing him in at the right time, you know, Colin got a chance to live out his dream and work for another racing team and continue to get more experience and exposure. So yeah, John doesn't have a trophy on the wall, but you know what? John is our champion. That's who John is. Well, that was very nice of him. And we certainly had a really good pass in what's called the carousel today. And we've got video of it. And we will upload it and show it to you sometime later. It's actually my favorite pass of all time. It was it was epic. So, um, I've had a good time this week. Um, it's been very nice, though. You know, I don't know I don't know what was said said about me by who. Um, I don't know. I don't know who, who he's interviewed. I don't know what he's done. Um, and I don't even know what this thing's going to look like when we're done. I have no editorial control. <laughs> um, you know, but at, at the end of the day, you are who you are and you do the best you can. It's the best you got, you know, and, and, and it's, as I said, you know, I did win the trophy. I did win the championship this year. I did, you know, and, and, and I, and I guess I win the championship every day. You know, if you don't feel that for yourself, seek it out, start small. But other than that, I'm going to bed. <laughs> uh,
Unfortunately, your cameraman's a piece of shit. Last race of the season. We've had a really good season. We found a lot of time in a lot of different racetracks. Um, overall, I think um, I think we're about eight and a half out of ten. You know, overall, I still have more time to find, um, but it's a process. And um, right now, I'm looking forward to the end of this year, the winter training and the karting, and and some of the other things we've got uh, scheduled with Mazda. We'll see what happens next year. Peace.